Hello everyone, I'm Danny Roddy and I wanted to welcome you to week number two of Organizing the Panic. Last week we discussed the genetic androgen hypothesis and this week we're going to go forward into a bioenergetic view of pattern baldness and we're going to discuss kind of a view of the organism in general because that's really what it takes to understand pattern hair loss I think. So we're going to compare the idea that the human is kind of this rigid piece of machine that's pre-programmed and controlled by the genes versus this idea that energy is constantly flowing through the organism, uh, that energy is uh, producing structure and the structure is producing energy and they're interdependent at every level. In addition to the organism constantly interacting with its environment and kind of pushing and pulling both ways. So the scope of this week's uh, presentation is pretty large, so please pause it at any point and read the references and maybe take notes. Uh, but also feel free to ask questions below uh, in the discuss comments. So with that, let's get right into it. Uh, this week's Organizing the Panic. Aging hair. Hair loss is ultimately a consequence of aging. Although there are no precise statistics, the incidence of male pattern baldness in whites is often quoted as approaching 100%. Others have suggested that half of men and women above 40 exhibit pattern baldness to some extent. This inevitably leads to the question of what causes aging. In 1916, experiments based on the metabolism of a fruit fly showed that a decreased temperature increased longevity. In the 1920s, Raymond Pearl suggested that being alive was harmful and proposed the rate of living theory of aging, which argued that organisms with fast metabolic rates have shorter lifespans than organisms with slower metabolic rates. Low temperature and decreased metabolism ties in nicely with the central dogma of molecular biology, which suggests that information flows from the DNA to the RNA and from the RNA to the protein of the cell, but never in the other direction. This also suggests that the environment has very little to do with the growth of the organism, as the genes already contain the information and they cannot be changed. What actually causes aging? In a landmark paper, the rate of living hypothesis was compared to the uncoupling to survive hypothesis. The uncoupled to survive hypothesis postulated that a higher metabolic rate led to increased longevity. It was found that mice with a 17% higher resting oxygen consumption lived 36% longer than slow respiring mice of a related strain, supporting the uncoupled to survive hypothesis. This is the equivalent to an age difference in humans from 75 to 102 years. How exactly does that work? The uncoupled to survive hypothesis is essentially a different view of the organism. This view is supported by many thinkers in the history of science. For instance, Nobel laureate Albert St. Georgie. Here are a few quotes from him. Treating humans without the concept of energy is treating dead matter. A living cell requires energy, not only for all of its functions, but also for the maintenance of its structure. Life supports life, function builds structure, and structure produces function. Once the function ceases, the structure collapses. It maintains itself by working. Dr. Gilbert Ling, who Albert St. Georgie said was one of the most inventive biochemists he had ever seen, also aligns with this bioenergetic view of life. In his book, Life at the Cell and Below Cell Level, Dr. Ling said, Smiling, laughing, and other normal physiological activities tell us that the baby is well. This is just a short way of saying that the trillions of cells making up the baby are well. Similarly, when the baby is sick, it is just a short way of saying that some or all of the baby's cells are sick. Raymond Peet, who in many ways has continued the work of both St. Georgie and Gilbert Ling, describes the importance of energy metabolism in all aspects of life. What could be more important to understand than biological energy? Thought, growth, movement, every philosophical and practical issue involves the nature of biological energy. The key idea was that energy and structure were interdependent at every level. And I think that's a good sentence that sums up the work of Dr. Ray Pete. The tissues produce energy and that the energy is reinforcing the structure of the tissue. What about the genes? In Carl C. Lindegren's book, Cold War and Biology, he states, Genetics is now engaged in a controversy between those who insist on the primary importance of the gene and those who oppose them. The contestants have often yielded to the temptation to support an accepted doctrine rather than an orderly and systemic search for a rational explanation. In a 2000 paper, S.W. Samuels wrote, 
Part of the problem, Lewinson points out, is the casual way in which geneticists speak. This is seen even in the naming of genes, he notes. Geneticists speak casually of the gene for white eyes, but of course there is no such gene. There is a variety of genes whose reading by the cell is proximately involved in the production of eye pigment and its deposition into eye cells. He points out that the genes are said to be self-replicating, engaged in gene action, make proteins, and are turned on or off by regulatory DNA. But none of this is true. DNA is among the most inert and non-reactive of organic molecules. Nobel laureate Barbara McClintock viewed the genome, which is the totality of all genetic material packaged into the chromosomes, as a highly sensitive organ of the cell that responds to and interacts with the environment. For instance, heat shock proteins can be activated in response to immediate danger, influencing the genome. A real-life example of this is the morphological evolution seen in Mexican cave fish. After being trapped in a cave, the species did away with their pigmentation in order to adapt to the darkness, developed heightened sensory systems to detect changes in water pressure, and perhaps most strikingly, lost their eyes. The rapid evolution of the Mexican cavefish suggests that it's the environment's interaction with the organism which produces changes. Ray Pete has suggested that chromosomes are internal resources, not clusters of traits, which would align with our example of Mexican cavefish as well as the work of Barbara McClintock. To bring it back to baldness, not even the foundational research suggested that pattern baldness was one's genetic destiny, but rather a physiological inheritance coupled with the right hormonal situation. In Volpel's Inherited Frailty and Longevity, he says, one possible explanation is that what children inherit from their parents is not their longevity per se, but rather their frailty, that is, a set of susceptible and risk factors that alters their chances of death at different ages. I would argue baldness is similar. Energy and Stress a few quotes we're going to be focusing on are a living cell requires energy not only for all its functions, but also for the maintenance of its structure by Albert St. Georgie. Treating humans without the concept of energy is treating dead matter, also by Albert St. Georgie. And Ray Pete's thesis, which he says, the key idea was that energy and structure were interdependent at every level. While it's difficult to describe, perhaps these photos of fruit fly larvae under polarized light microscopes best demonstrate the beautiful energetics of an organism. It's important to remember that the fruit fly is not unique and that all organisms look similar under a polarized light microscope. What is efficient energy? Glucose is reduced to 2 pyruvate in the cytoplasm of the cell. Pyruvate are reduced to acetyl-CoA and carbon dioxide via pyruvate dehydrogenase or the link reaction. Acetyl-CoA is metabolized in the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, the business end of cell respiration to ATP, water, and more carbon dioxide. What is inefficient energy? This is sometimes just referred to as glycolysis. Glucose is reduced to pyruvate in the cytoplasm. However, there is no oxygen or oxygen cannot be utilized, such as a carbon dioxide deficiency. Pyruvate is shunted to the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, and lactic acid is formed. What's the role of carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is often referred to as a waste product. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Among its many roles, carbon dioxide allows cells, tissues, and organs to better absorb oxygen by dissociating oxygen from the hemoglobin molecule. This is referred to as the Bohr effect. Similarly, carbon dioxide is retained in the tissues in hypoxic or low oxygen high altitudes. This is referred to as the Haldane effect. Cells are essentially bracketed by the availability of glucose and oxygen, and carbon dioxide is regulating the use of both of these substances. What about using fat as fuel? Everyone is using fat as fuel to some extent. However, using fat as fuel or beta oxidation skips glycolysis and the link reaction and provides acetyl-CoA for the Krebs cycle. This provides less carbon dioxide in addition to other mechanisms which can slow the rate of metabolism. Why does this matter again? Cells form tissues, tissues form organs, and organs form you. Again, the key idea was that energy and structure are interdependent at every level. Life supports life, function builds structure, and structure produces function. Once the function ceases, the structure collapses. 
it maintains itself by working. The structure and function of the tissue depend on the energy that the tissue is producing. The mini organ. The hair follicle is often referred to as a mini organ. The hair follicle maintains its structure by the cohesion of cells. The hair follicle requires oxygen and an energy source, e.g. glucose, fructose, or pyruvate, to grow. Pathways to yield ATP, or energy, should be accelerated to meet energy requirements for the growth of hair. Growing hair requires two times the amount of glucose that resting follicles do. However, hair follicles are extremely inefficient at producing energy, converting proportionately more glucose to lactic acid rather than carbon dioxide. Glucose, and not fat, is the primary fuel of hair follicles. In fact, fatty acids or ketone bodies cannot sustain hair growth in vitro. Tying this all together was a landmark paper describing the association between mitochondrial dysfunction and hair aging. The group concluded that thyroid hormone could be repositioned as mitochondrial hair medicine. This is no surprise as thyroid hormone is often called the hormone of respiration and is needed for the efficient production of energy. Carbon dioxide cannot be produced efficiently without thyroid hormone. Moreover, thyroid hormone is needed to energize cells, which maintains their structure. When thyroid hormone is absent, the cell loses its organization and damage to the mitochondria occurs. While it may seem far-fetched to influence how our cells produce energy, there are many known factors which influence energy metabolism. Free fatty acids. Although all fats and oils, whether of vegetable or plant origin, contain a mixture of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats, they differ in the proportions of each of these fats. That is to say, the main difference is a matter of degree, not kind. Polyunsaturated fats, such as soybean oil, dominate the Western food supply, providing a large amount of calories in the diet. Fat tissue reflects the type of dietary fat consumed over a lifetime and hormones and signaling substances liberate free fatty acids from the adipose tissue into the blood during times of stress. For instance, there seems to be little doubt that there are signals for the increased mobilization of fat in shock, trauma, and sepsis, and the enhanced mobilization and oxidation of fat is one of the fundamental responses to stress. Normally, if the diet contained proportionately more saturated fat than unsaturated fat, the stress response would be self-limiting. However, this is not the case in 2014. A main adaptive function of the free fatty acids is to reduce the rate of metabolism. In the short term, fatty acid metabolism inhibits the uptake and oxidation of glucose, or efficient energy metabolism, as the British biochemist Sir Philip Randall's hypothesis states. While many problems are blamed on elevated levels of glucose, it was found that high levels of free fatty acids in the blood is seen before high levels of glucose. Additionally, sometimes it's said that those with poor glucose tolerance can't burn glucose. However, there's an association between diabetes and increased levels of lactic acid, suggesting that glucose is getting into the cell, but it is not being oxidized or used with oxygen. So-called metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance are associated with early onset male pattern baldness. Taken together with the poor efficiency at which hair follicles generate energy, trouble oxidizing glucose to carbon dioxide is not unexpected. The adaptive stress substances. The thyroid and the pituitary appear to have an inverse relationship. The hormones of the pituitary are strongly lipogenic or they release free fatty acids reducing peripheral tissues, such as the scalp's, response to thyroid hormones. If your thyroid is working efficiently, your pituitary doesn't have much to do, and you're not likely to get a pituitary tumor. Your adrenals don't have much to do, and your ovaries don't get overstimulated. The other glands have an easy job when your thyroid is working right. If your thyroid gets interfered with, you have to rev up your adrenals, and your pituitary becomes commander-in-chief and tells everyone what to do. When energy metabolism is inefficient and the thyroid is no longer available as a cofactor for the production of the protective steroids pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA from cholesterol, there is an increased need for the adaptive stress substances to maintain energy metabolism. The pituitary releases ACTH, which signals the adrenal glands to release cortisol. 
Cortisol's main function is to synthesize glucose at the organism's expense, for instance, from the thymus gland or the muscles. Cortisol inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3, which is responsible for the respiratory production of energy and carbon dioxide, or efficient energy. Cortisol and the other counter-regulatory hormones are released during times of hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. Unsurprisingly, it was shown that there was a significant increase in cortisol in both male and female patients with androgenic alopecia. Similarly, the protective hormone DHEA rises during stress and parallels cortisol. DHEA was found to be elevated in young men with pattern baldness and suggests that adrenal hyperactivity, i.e. low thyroid, is part of the pathogenesis of pattern baldness. Recently, it was found that human hair follicles produce their own cortisol locally. This opens up an unexplored world of hair follicle energy metabolism. Another hormone involved in the genesis of pattern baldness is estrogen. Produced by virtually any tissue, estrogen is synthesized during injury and tissue repair. Its main function is to quickly grow tissue by inhibiting efficient or oxidative mitochondrial metabolism, causing cells to swell and divide. In 1947, Hans Selye discovered that estrogen mimicked the most severe state of stress, shock. Rejecting the name, Selye preferred to call estrogen adipin because of its production in the fat tissue, the adipocytes, or folliculin because of the ovarian follicle's significant role in its production. In a paper, it was seen that stress immediately and persistently increases estrogen levels in animals. The estrogen produced is maladaptive, or in other words, it's not helpful for overcoming the stress. It was found that estrogen stimulates cortisol in a dose-dependent manner. And perhaps most importantly, elevated estrogen levels were seen in males with pattern baldness. The liberation of free fatty acids into the blood appears to increase estrogen levels. One of the ways free fatty acids increase estrogen is by lowering sex hormone binding globulin, which binds to estrogen and keeps it out of cells. Lower levels of sex hormone binding globulin are commonly associated with pattern hair loss. Another way estrogen contributes towards baldness is by increasing the activity of an enzyme that synthesizes hormone-like messengers from free fatty acids called prostaglandins. A type of prostaglandin, prostaglandin D2, was recently discovered to accumulate in the scalps of men with pattern baldness. Estrogen also stimulates the release of the hormone prolactin from the pituitary. The main function of prolactin is to remove calcium from bone, which can act as a large reservoir of minerals. One of the most important mechanisms of the adaptive effect of prolactin is its ability to suppress thyroid function, thus decreasing the metabolism level, which results in the reduction of oxygen consumption. Prolactin has been called the molting hormone in animal models. However, it is somehow identified as the mothering hormone in humans due to its role in producing milk. A higher functioning of prolactin is associated with pattern baldness. In my own research, slightly elevated levels of prolactin appear to contribute to a wide variety of problems. Prolactin removes calcium from bone, and the parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone to replace the lost calcium by also breaking down bone. Parathyroid hormone plays a role in general aging as well as various skin problems including hair loss. Balding men were found to have a reduced bone mineral density, suggesting a higher functioning of various anti-bone substances. In my own research, it is not uncommon for people to have higher levels of parathyroid hormone on lab tests. The last hormone we'll discuss is aldosterone. Aldosterone is another adaptive stress hormone that is responsible for sodium retention during emergencies. Sometimes it is referred to as the salt-retaining hormone. In excess, aldosterone is inflammatory and is involved in the most complex biochemical webs of stress. Elevated levels of aldosterone are seen in men and women with pattern baldness. Unfavorable structural changes. An increased reliance on inefficient energy metabolism and the higher functioning of the adaptive stress substances causes unfavorable structural changes in the scalp. It was found that those with pattern baldness experience an accumulation of mucopolysaccharides in the scalp which is a hallmark of inefficient energy metabolism. In advanced baldness, there is a loss of mucopolysaccharides, degeneration of the vascular network supplying blood to the follicles, 
and by sclerosis of connective tissue. Mucopolysaccharides can act as a matrix for calcification. Our observations suggest elaboration of acid mucopolysaccharides play an intermediate role in the pathogenesis of calcification by its ability to bind calcium or by the initial binding of iron and its replacement by calcium. The idea that baldness results from errant calcification goes back to 1942, when Dr. Holzel removed the brains of about 80 cadavers. He noticed that in those with baldness, calcification knitted the cranial structures together, but also closed or narrowed various foramens through which the blood vessels pass. Supporting Dr. Holzel's observations, there was a statistical difference in the rate of blood flow between balding and non-balding men. Additionally, there is tissue hypoxia, or a lack of oxygen, in balding scalp tissues. I think this suggests that respiration or efficient energy is stifled in pattern baldness, and not enough carbon dioxide is being produced. Hormones like estrogen decrease the rate of oxygen consumption, as does prolactin, cortisol, aldosterone, and parathyroid hormone. Additionally, estrogen and prostaglandins cause cells to take up calcium, which has been referred to as the final common path in cell aging and death. The hair may be especially susceptible to these processes because of its inherent inefficiency in energy metabolism. Revisiting Evidence the hypothesis that a decreased rate of metabolism and a higher functioning of the adaptive stress substances, which cause unfavorable structural changes in the scalp, must also explain why Hamilton's castrates and Imperato McGinley's pseudohermaphrodites were protected from baldness 100% of the time. Hamilton's castrates had three distinct qualities. They were 100% immune to inherited pattern baldness. They had reduced oily secretions from the sebaceous glands. They had minimal to no dandruff. When investigating a castrate's hormonal profile, we find that besides producing virtually no androgens like testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, they also produce less estrogen and prolactin, which estrogen increases. Cortisol, estrogen, and prolactin influence the sebaceous glands. In particular, prolactin activates the formation of sebum or oil by the skin. The anti-prolactin drug bromocryptine was found to be effective in treating acne. In comparison, an anti-androgen drug was ineffective in treating acne. Regarding dandruff, in my own research, dandruff is either remedied by thyroid hormone, vitamin A, or sometimes zinc, all of which oppose estrogen and prolactin and increase progesterone. What about the pseudohermaphrodites? Similar to castration, pseudohermaphrodites are found to have an increase in hair protective substances. One of the hormones that appears to increase in a pseudohermaphrodite is progesterone, which opposes every single inflammatory shift seen in pattern baldness. However, it should be noted that this hormone is feminizing. What about finasteride? It is said that finasteride works by decreasing the 5-alpha reductase enzyme and reducing concentrations of dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. However, progesterone and finasteride are chemically similar. Also, finasteride can feminize men, causing them to grow breasts. As stated earlier, progesterone is also feminizing. The mechanism might be that finasteride causes an increase in the gonadotrophin luteinizing hormone, or LH, which signals the testicles to produce progesterone, among other things. In summary, castration and pseudohermaphrodites have reduced levels of androgens, they rely on a higher functioning of progesterone and other protective hormones. These hormones oppose all the negative shifts seen in pattern baldness. However, it leads to feminization as seen in castration, somewhat in pseudohermaphrodites, and in those who take finasteride. What about postpartum pregnancy? One of the clearest examples of how estrogen and progesterone affect hair growth is during pregnancy when there is an increase in hair growth rate, hair diameter, and the ratio of growing hairs to resting hairs, all of which results in a lush head of hair. In fact, in some cases, pregnancy reverses male pattern baldness in women. In contrast to the beneficial effects of pregnancy on hair growth, postpartum women routinely experience dramatic hair loss. After giving birth, when progesterone levels fall sharply and estrogen and prolactin, the lactation or molting hormone, levels increase, the lush head of hair that had developed during pregnancy, when progesterone levels were soaring, disappears. 
In fact, the increase in inflammatory markers seen postpartum was referred to as functional progesterone withdrawal in one paper. In summary, pregnancy results in 100 times the normal level of progesterone. Progesterone opposes various shifts seen in pattern baldness, resulting in a lush head of hair. However, after birth, a functional progesterone withdrawal occurs and an increase in estrogen and prolactin, which leads to hair loss. What about menopause? While professionals often proclaim menopause as an estrogen deficiency, as if there were no doubt about it, it is very clear instead that an elevated ratio of estrogen to progesterone is involved. Estrogen concentrations in tissues correlates positively with aging and with body fat levels. Blood levels of estrogen do not necessarily reflect tissue concentrations of estrogen. Likewise, there is a higher functioning of prolactin in menopause, which estrogen stimulates. What about contraceptives? Contraceptives containing estrogen or estrogen-like progesterones can produce male pattern baldness. What about postnatal baldness? Soon after birth, marked hair loss is seen in newborn infants of both sexes. Baldness is seen in the same areas that hair is lost from grown men and women with pattern baldness. Birth appears to be extremely stressful on the newborn child. For instance, the womb is characterized by an extremely high concentration of carbon dioxide. When the baby is born, it instantly loses its efficient energy advantage or respiratory advantage and is exposed to a large amount of oxygen and may initiate postnatal male pattern baldness. This possibility is evidenced by the tendency towards an elevation in prolactin upon birth. It's very important to note that these conditions of male pattern baldness are usually considered to be age-related and androgen-independent or both. Why is the aging male subject to the genetic androgen hypothesis while others experience the same problem and are subject to completely different theories? Continuing with our bioenergetic view of the organism, we turn to ways to alter the environment to oppose the various shifts seen in pattern baldness. So that wraps up this week's Organizing the Panic. The take home being that energy metabolism is interfered in those with pattern baldness. There is an increased reliance on the adaptive stress hormones and those cause unfavorable changes in the scalp of those with pattern baldness. So understanding that baldness is the result of a maladaptation to the environment, we can do things in our environment to change the outcome and possibly stop hair loss or reverse it altogether. So we're gonna focus on nutrition. In addition to self-diagnostics and lab work, one can utilize to kind of guide nutrition because I think without that, uh, just kind of following an arbitrary diet and hoping things get better without measuring anything is a real problem, especially in today's health industry. So I think it's a, a really smart approach to measure things such as the pulse rate and the temperature. In addition to lab work, if you're truly motivated to kind of figure things out and eliminate a lot of the guesswork. And we're gonna talk about that in full detail next week. So again, feel free to ask questions below. And also you can email me at dannyroddy at gmail.com and I'll talk to you guys next week.